you're going to be blessed with this message too. We're going to talk about crossing over tonight. Scripture that is we all know so well, but I think you're going to see it in a d little different light tonight. I believe you're going to be so blessed, and I hope prophetically you will hear it. You'll hear it prophetically. Joshua 3, 1 through 5. Early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left Achaia Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River, where they camped before crossing. Three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp, giving these instructions to the people. When you see the Levitical priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, move out from your positions and follow them. Since you have never traveled this way before, they will guide you. Stay about half a mile behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the Ark. Make sure you don't come any closer. Then Joshua told the people, purify yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. So the people left their camp to cross the Jordan, and priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. It was the harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as, it, as the feet of the priests who were carrying the Ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water above that point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near... Uh, Zarathan, and the water below that point flowed on to the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. Meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by. They waited there until the whole nation of Israel had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. Now let me point out some things to you. You remember that 40 years earlier, the children of Israel were supernaturally delivered from Egypt from some 400 years of oppression. A journey that should have taken actually and should have been totally completed in 14 days took 40 years because of three reasons. Because of their attitudes, because of their complaining, and because of their hard hearts toward the Lord. Instead of a relatively quick transition to freedom in the land God had promised them, they wandered around in circles in the desert until the very last person died of those who came out of Egypt. Now, so we're talking about everybody who's 20 years old and above. They all died. So a whole generation died. Can you imagine, we've talked about it before, can you imagine being, you know, <laughs> the last person alive and knowing that everybody was waiting on you to kill over? <laughs> you know, <laughs> wanting you to die and to die as fast as you could so they could go in the promised land. I mean, that's exactly what was going on. So it was their children 40 years later who finally took hold of the promise and they finally crossed over the Jordan River. What an amazing thing to imagine what really happened then. Approximately one million people died in those 40 years. And so this generation that's getting ready to go into the land had never experienced what they were about to experience. Their parents and their grandparents had lived in the land of not enough. But this generation only knew the land of just enough. What we sometimes call the wilderness. Did you get that? The land of not enough, Egypt. This generation knew the land of just enough of walking around as God took care of them. We've all made trips. There's not anybody in here who hadn't been to the wilderness during our lives. And many of us have gone around circles many times. And I doubt there's not anyone here who could not testify to the grace of God 
that has not brought you out of the wilderness at some point in your life. I've made several wilderness trips. How about you? But like us, that generation wandered around in circles, not because God kept them there, but because they kept themselves there. God didn't take me to a wilderness. I took myself to a wilderness. God didn't prescribe a time for me to be there. I did. Out of being hard-hearted, hard-headed, and just doing things my way. It was as if God said, fine, you want to keep on complaining? You want to keep griping? Just keep it up until you decide that you really want what I promised you. A land flowing with milk and honey. And whenever you're ready to move on, I'm here to lead you. I'll take you. When you determine, you're ready to go. You see, church, God has prepared good things for us, but he waits until we're ready to move on and to live in the promised land. Don't act like you're always ready to go. It's sort of like people acting like they're ready to go to heaven or ready to be raptured. I hear people all the time say, well, you know, I, I believe in the rapture. I want to be raptured, but I'm just not ready to go now. I hear it all the time. I've got things I want to do, I want my children to do. Talking about things that we can do on this crazy, stupid earth. That is a pain. And we'd rather stay here than to be raptured. That's because we don't know what heavens are like. We've had this fairy tale, some kind of crazy something. When you get to heaven, you're going to be on a cloud playing a harp and naked. Where in the world that came from, I have no earthly idea. And so we have heaven being this place that is not real. Earth is better. Earth has more to offer. Earth is more modern. Earth has more technology. What is your problem other than stupid? <laughs> and a lack of understanding of the word of God. Heaven, earth is a replica, the Bible says, of heaven, except it's fallen. You need to get it through your heads. There are trees and rivers and buildings and houses and skylines and all kind of things. It's heaven. There's work. There's all kind of things. It's, it's, <laughs> help us, Jesus. Where, who made that up? thing about lying on a cloud naked. I have no earthly idea. Being a cherub, dear Jesus. Mm. It wasn't God that dropped you into a dry and barren place. We chose to go there. And when you're really ready to leave, as I said, you can get out whenever you want to. He'll bring you out. Many of us have found ourselves in wilderness places in, 19, in 2023. There have been some wilderness for a lot of people in 2023. And obviously we survived it. We're here tonight. You live through the year. Thank God and learn to trust him in the land of just enough. By exercising your faith and by receiving from his faithfulness. Perhaps some of us have been just like the children of Israel when they had just enough manna, just enough quail, just enough water to make it, but not enough to declare that you were in the land of more than enough. And the land of milk and honey, the promised land, or the land of abundance. You had not touched it, but you were willing to stay in the land of just enough enough. I meet people like that all the time. And if you're honest, you do too. Well, I'm okay. 
It's all right. Not the best, but it's all right. I can handle it. It's okay. Well, church, this New Year's Eve, I've got some good news for you. The land of more than enough is on the horizon. And it's called heaven. It's the place of perfect and total provision of abundant joy and amazing peace. Glory to God. It's the home we're looking for. It's the home that we can anticipate, the home to which we will be taken the very moment that God the Father picks up his trumpet <laughs> and says to his son, go get your brethren and bring them home. Amen. All of heaven, they're ready for us. They're cooking up extra food. They got everything ready. Hallelujah. Your wardrobe's all been made. Fit you exactly in the colors you like and the, the sashes and the bows and the things. God knows you better than you know you. Everything is ready. Waiting for one thing and one thing only. The Father to pick up the trumpet and blow it. Now, if you think you and I are keeping him from blowing it, people tell me that all the time. You think that, uh, you know, something we're doing down here may be holding him up? <laughs> no. His timetable is his timetable. And it was predetermined before the world itself even got here. So it's already set. That date, nothing nor no one. Nobody is going to change that moment. Amen. Whether it happens now, tomorrow, whenever it happens, it's a predetermined date with the Father that you and I have. So what happened in the natural during Joshua's time will speak prophetically to us about our deliverance that we're waiting on. And it is a deliverance. Amen. When you and I get out of here, yeah. when we leave this old world and we get to the place, we meet all our family, all our friends who are waiting on us, and you move in that place where you really come alive. You're not really alive here. You're dying. It's not anybody in this room who's not dying. You say, well, I don't feel like I'm dying. Well, so what? <laughs> Sometimes you feel like you're smart and you're not, so. <laughs> so hallelujah. What's feelings got to do with it? So you can ask anybody anywhere. You're on your way out, honey. And if the Lord don't pick you up, whoo-hoo. So. The signs of the Lord's coming are everywhere. Amen. And they continue to increase. But to get there, <laughs> like the children of Israel, you and I have to cross over. Something we have to do. And since we are the fig tree generation, we have the unique opportunity to be led by our Joshua, the Lord Jesus Christ, into a place that none of us have ever experienced before. And Joshua prophetically tells us how to prepare ourselves, get this one, to join the ranks of Enoch and Elijah. Amen. Now that'll make some of you think, and some of you, some of you are thinking, Enoch and Elijah, who is that? <laughs> no. They went up without dying, if you remember. Amen. Maybe you don't like to think about going up in the rapture. I do. It means I won't die. Amen. Now, if you, you know, got yourself prepared for the grave, then go for it. <laughs> but you and I know that none of us will ever go by the way of the grave anyway. 
There is no such thing as dead, dead. There's no such thing as anybody being in the cemetery, no matter how many flowers you put out there. And so we're not going to die. But our bodies may die. But we won't die. But Enoch and Elijah's body didn't die. And that's the company that we're going to join. Of course, they're going to be coming back after we leave. Just thought I'd throw that out. Joshua said it to the people. Told them how to get ready. Purify yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. Another translation says it this way. Consecrate yourselves. Consecration is the decision that you and I make to present ourselves to the Lord as a living sacrifice. Consecration, most of us don't like to talk about. It's a big word. It means to make holy, to set apart, to dedicate oneself to the Lord without reservation. In other words, holding nothing back at all. Now, the Lord will not force anyone to surrender, but he cannot use anyone that is unsurrendered, for he will not overrule your will. He'll let you do what you want to do. So anytime you find somebody in some place they don't want to be, they got themselves there. Romans 12, 1 through 2. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Amen. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Have you learned that consecration has a time element attached to it? God has no vending machine church <laughs> in heaven that spits out hundreds and fifties every time you give your tithe. Now, maybe you didn't catch that because there are a lot of people who say, I tithe and I didn't get nothing back and you said I would. People say a lot of things to me, and I've learned just to say, mm-hmm, and just smile at them and keep going. I don't even, no need to stop. You should stop and try to talk to them. Well, forget that. I just keep going. God always makes good on his promises, but he does it, as you've learned, in his time and in his way. Consecration is best exemplified by what Shadrach, Meshach, and a minute ago had to say in Daniel 3. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of the blazing fire. You know, he's talking to Nebuchadnezzar. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does it, then let it be known to you, O king, that we're not going to serve your gods. We're not going to worship the golden image that you set up. We're not going to do it. Now, that's consecration. So the point one that the Lord wants us to grab hold of, we are to be consecrated. Point two is go all in for Jesus. So when it was time to cross over, the Jordan was overflowing, which anybody knows is not a good time to cross the river at that time. But faith overruled, Joshua 3, 13. The priests would carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. As soon as their feet touched the water, the flow of water would be cut off upstream. And the river would stand up like a wall. So the people left their camp to cross the Jordan, and the priests who were carrying the ark of the covenant were ahead of them. It was the harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water above that point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam. 
which is near Zarethan. And the water below that point flowed down to the Red Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. Now, let's just talk about this for a minute. You do know that that took quite some faith. I mean, you do know that, don't you? Well, let, let me help you see it. It backed up for 20 miles. It, uh, at that time, the Jordan River was almost eight miles wide. Those of us who've been to Israel on several occasions, you think you can throw a rock across it. Well, hello. We're talking about thousands of years ago. It was at that point. Actually, they say eight miles, but the Lord reminded me they went across the smallest portion, so it was only six miles wide. And it backed up 130 feet high. That's a pretty good distance. It helps you understand why the people in Jericho were so scared. They saw it. 20 miles of backup. Well, you understand why they needed so much space. There are almost three and a half million Israelis who walked across. That is a tremendous amount of people. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was the outward symbol of the presence of God. Amen. And it was leading the way. The people were challenged to overcome any doubt or any fear as they looked at the raging river that was overflowing its banks. Listen to this prophetically. Maybe insights to what we're about to face. Because we're in the time and season of the Lord's return. And it's a time that we will be crossing over relatively soon. Amen. But there are things that we may have to deal with and use our faith in order to cross over. They had to believe that Joshua was hearing from the Lord. I mean, Moses wasn't there anymore. Of course, you have to understand, it wasn't a matter of following some young man. He was 80. Joshua was. We're the Joshua generation. <laughs> I laugh every time I hear that. <laughs> That's who I am. The Joshua generation. He was 80 when he took leadership. So they had to believe that young Joshua, who took the place of Moses, was going, that he really was hearing God and what they were about to do. See, sometimes we don't put it together that believing for the soon return of Jesus to take us home is also a matter of faith. Amen. Amen. That's why everybody doesn't believe. You see, the signs that point to the rapture, they're everywhere. But many people see signs and they still don't believe. There are people in this church, I'm sure, who've been listening to me for God knows how long. And I've been talking about Jesus coming ever since I started. They still don't believe it. I've been talking about the rapture of the church. Maybe, maybe you didn't realize that much of the church world have never even heard of the word rapture. They don't even know there is such a thing as a rapture. And the Catholic church is wasn't even talked. In many denominations... They teach the second coming of the Lord. There's a distinction between the rapture and the second coming. Amen. It's far easier 
to believe in the second coming than it is in the rapture. The rapture is in the twinkling of an eye. The rapture, we're saying we're going to be shoom, gone. You're talking about faith? I mean, we're just going to be sitting here and all of a sudden we're not here. Quite a story. Of course, it's not much crazier than believing you're going to go to heaven to a place you've never been and live in all these mansions that you've never even seen. And, and you believe you got some real estate up there. <laughs> Following Jesus is a faith walk. Hallelujah. Amen. Believe he came and died for you. Yes. That he took your place. Yes. Set you free. Yes. Made you a king and priest. Yes. I believe. The signs of the return of the Lord, they're clues, which God put into his word for mine and your sake, to keep us from being ignorant of the times in which you and I find ourselves living in. And yet, people still don't believe. But the signs don't mean anything unless faith is operating. If you're not letting your faith work, you will not be ready or even believe in the rapture. And the signs that you're watching, you won't believe they're really happening. You'll explain them away some way. You'll end up saying it's always been this way. That's what people say. It's all, there's always been wars. There's always been rumors of wars. There's always been this. There's always been that. Faith is not working there because they are trying to explain it away in their heads and they're not interpreting what God gives them to help them know where they really are. Amen. Signs. So God gives you and I signs so that you and I can know how close we are, like signposts on a road. And so that's what the signs are to believers. Those who know signs. And again, you have to understand, most of the church world, people don't even talk about signs. They don't, they don't have any earthly idea of what we're talking about. Why? Because they don't want to. And on top of that, preachers don't teach it. And why don't they teach it? Because they don't want to run their, their flock away. It calls for commitment. It calls for being radical. It, calls, it makes you step outside of yourself to believe. So most preachers don't really preach very much about the rapture of the church. If you don't know that, then you've not been keeping up with things. You'd be amazed if you talked to some of your friends, you'd find out they don't know anything. They really don't. There's an old proverb that says, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Look at Hebrews 11.1. 1. We know this verse. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. I gave this definition this morning. Faith has the capacity to look beyond the present and see what the grace of God is going to do in a life. You see, church... You can't live off of grandma's faith. Amen. You can't live off your spouse's faith. Amen. It's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Faith is a personal decision. Now, every one of those Israelites standing near the shore of the Jordan, every single one of them had to make a decision. Every one. Six miles of crossing the water with a 130 foot standing water. Have you ever tried to make some water stand? <laughs> water don't stand. Y'all do know that. I mean, it don't stand. You can't stack it up. I don't know how far 130 feet is, but it's pretty far. To be stacked up 20 miles 
of it. Three and a half million people crossing over. Wow. They had to come, every single one. They'd been looking for three days at the water. For three days, they'd seen the floods. You know, a flooding river moves fast. And the Lord told them, stare at it for three days. Make your mind up. Get yourself ready. He was saying, prepare yourself. Because this event is about to happen. You're going to cross over. Get yourself ready. Isn't that what he said this morning? Isn't that what this morning was about? Get yourself ready. I'm laying it out for you. Get ready, he said. You're about to cross over. Everyone told us how. Told us how to start over. Told us how to lay it down. And keep on going. They couldn't allow themselves to be moved by the Russian waters. Or they couldn't give in to the fear of drowning. Now, you know, you and I can sit here and say, well, ho-hum, ho-hum. Ho-hum nothing. If it was me, I'd be in the middle. <laughs> I'd make sure there are a lot of people on either side of me, wouldn't you? <laughs> I'd be holding on to them. And once the Lord pushed back the waters into a high wall on either side, they had to believe that the waters could stay up there and that they could still walk on dry ground without that water coming crashing down on you. Six miles of it, not 60 feet, not 60 yards, six miles of it. That's a long way to cross and to walk between the water with everybody. You three and a half million. We couldn't have three and a half dozen without every somebody just passing out or somebody saying this ain't gonna work or watch out. You know, I mean, God's good for a while, but I mean. You better hurry up. This thing's going to crash down any minute. I mean, come on. You know, that's the way we are. And there's always a smart aleck. There's always somebody who, who has some. Now, you know, I don't know how they made this happen, but it ain't going to last forever. You know, technology can only go so far. What kind of technology? They had none. <laughs> Imagine. Put yourself there. Imagine that. Hmm. Look at Joshua 3, 15 and 16 again. It was the harvest season. The Lord wants us to get it. It is harvest season now. You do know that. It's the harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priest who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, we don't even want to walk out on the park carrying that ark. Well, anyway, let me go ahead touched the water at the river's edge, the water above that point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarathan. And the water below that point flowed on into the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. Oh, we don't read that three times. You reckon he's trying to say something to us? Put yourself in the event. Get in it. Imagine yourself stepping into the riverbed with high walls of water. Shimmering on either side of you. You know, could you step in the riverbed unafraid? Let's be honest. I couldn't. I don't care how brave the person beside me looked. You know? And what about the priest? How about this one? How about the priest who carried the ark into the riverbed? They had to go first. And they were told to stand there until every last person crossed over. Seventeen basic hours. Aren't you glad? Oh, you, you, I forgot. We are priests. 
stand in this riverbed for possibly 17 hours. Hold the ark. Stand there. Watch everybody else go by. You know, as I said, there's always some smart aleck who will walk by a priest and said, you're a fool standing here. You better get on with that water. It's about to fall any minute. <laughs> Have y'all not met people like that? When you're trying to do your very best for the Lord and they come by and just a little smart aleck that they are? Don't think they weren't there then. I think they had more faith than what you and I could possibly imagine standing there while everybody else is getting out. They're still standing. Joshua 3.17 Meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by. They waited there until the whole nation of Israel had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. You know, we like to talk about miracles like these, but when the rivers of life are threatening to overwhelm you and me, will we be all in it for Jesus? Trusting Him with every fiber of our being. There's a key here to successfully pursuing the presence of God. The priest and the people had to commit to the rhythm of the Holy Spirit. They couldn't run ahead of the ark. They could not lag behind it. God told Joshua to follow a half mile behind it so that if the ark had to go to the left, Joshua could see so he could lead the people to the left. If it went to the right, he had to see so that he could anticipate the way that they were going to go. They couldn't just hurry through the situation. Did you know that God is never in a hurry? I may not know much, but I do know that. But he's always right on time. God, not, God does not run his clock by our daylight savings time. He has his own clock, evidently. And he doesn't share it with me or thee. That's why Jesus said, no man knows the day nor the hour. Now, I gave you a big hint to that statement this morning when I said, time I stood up, and New Zealand is already 2024. Yeah. Big clue for those who like to say, the Bible says, oh, nobody knows the day nor the hour. Well, the Lord could say, I'm coming on the third. What third? <laughs> what third? Our third? New Zealand's third? China's third? California's third? What third? I'm coming on the third. It's really pretty clear. No one will know the day nor an hour. That's not a good one to hide behind. Too often we fall into moving ahead of God or we lag behind him. We need to be like Moses who said, if you're not moving God, then I'm not moving. The more we commit to being led by the Spirit, the less we'll find ourselves stumbling around instead of running the race. Walking to a river in flooding season before you see it, it takes faith. Before you see it part, before you see the waters do anything, that's what the priest had to do. Believing Jesus is coming in the twinkling of an eye also takes faith. As I said, it's far easier to believe in the second coming than in the rapture of the church because that's really a wild story. We're getting out of here. You won't even see me go. Hallelujah. As we close, can you identify with the following statements? Faith says, I'm getting ready to cross over. Faith says, I need to alert my family and friends about his coming, even if they scoff at me. Faith says, purify my heart, Lord, that I may come into your presence 
without spot or wrinkle. Faith says Jesus is coming and we're about to go home. Amen. It's crossover time. Amen. Get ready. Make yourself ready for the journey, the event, the rapture of the church. We're getting ready to leave. Amen.